What is up guys, in this tutorial I'm going to be telling you everything you need to know about Sequencer in order to create your very first cinematic in UE4 or UE5. I'm going to be telling you how to use Sequencer, give you all the tips and tricks I've used when creating my own cinematics, and tell you about the annoying things to watch out for. Because trust me, a lot of annoying things can happen in Sequencer. So, the first thing we're going to do is click Cinematics at the top of the page and add Master Sequence. The main difference between these options is that a level sequence will create one clip and a master sequence will create numerous clips that we can work with. So when you do this, the sequencer tool will pop up and if you ever lose this tab, you can right click your sequence in your level and click edit or you can go up to the cinematics at the top and select your sequence here. So this is your timeline and by pressing space, your timeline will run and your movie will play. Now, before we do anything, I'd recommend clicking the FPS button and changing your FPS to 60. This will increase the number of frames seen on screen per second. So this will make your video seem more smooth and focused. I'd highly recommend going for 60 FPS or higher if you're making a trailer for realism and 30 FPS for gameplay to give it a more video game feel. So I'm gonna click the dropdown and select 60 FPS. Also, I like to see my timeline in seconds rather than frames, so I'm going to click show time as and then select seconds, but this is up to you guys. Now, let's dive into our first shot by double clicking on it. So, this is our sequence. Our camera cut is basically our movie clip, and we have one track in our sequence, which is a camera, and it has various properties. So first, let's set up our viewport, our screen. Let's adjust our screens by clicking the drop down, going to layout, and selecting dual screen. Now we can click the camera cut camera button to lock our screens to what our camera is seeing. Or just below it, we can click the camera's camera button to lock ourselves to the camera. Both of these do the same thing, but when you lock to your camera, you will pilot it. Meaning we can move our camera around the same way we'd usually move around our screen. It can be useful for setting up the camera into the correct position, but I prefer manually adjusting the camera, so I'm going to click the camera cuts camera button. So, we want our left screen to be our normal viewport. So let's click the drop down and uncheck allow cinematic control. And let's put the viewport back to normal perspective mode. Okay, cool. So normal view left, camera view right. So sometimes you'll need a bigger screen to see details or to watch your scene back. For this, we can either click the button in the top right of the screen to take over both screens, or we can press F11 with the screen selected to take it to full screen. Then we can press F11 again to take us back out again. To alter a clip's length, we need to do a few things. We first need to extend the clip by moving the red line over to the right. We then need to actually extend our camera cut clip. Make sure this clip is always filling the entire bar. Then, you'll also see another red line here which we can't do anything with. And to extend this, we actually need to hop out of our clip by selecting our sequence master and we need to extend the actual length of our clip here. Now if you want to create another clip, we can either right click one of our shots and duplicate or we can click the plus symbol and either insert a pre-existing shot or click insert shot to create a new one. Okay, that's all the settings out of the way. Let's create some clips. So hop into your scene one. So here we have our camera and its numerous settings. Now, very quickly, aperture is how much of the scene you want to be in focus. Low aperture being a small amount and high aperture being a large amount. Focal length, to put very simply, is how wide or zoomed in your shot is. And focus distance is where your camera is focusing on. So what we can do is go to zero on our timeline, move our camera into a start position, then click the plus sign by our camera transform to create a keyframe. And a keyframe is basically just a bit of stored information, and in this case, we've stored a transform. Now, we're going to select our camera actor and look in the details. Click the focus settings drop down, and what we can do is position our left screen into a similar position as our camera. Then we can select the eyedropper in the details and click on our screen where we want our camera to focus. When you click, your camera will adjust its focus to focus on the point you clicked on. But sometimes it doesn't get it right, or your click may go through the object. For this, I'd recommend bringing in a cube, placing the cube over the point you want to focus on, and selecting the cube using the focus eyedropper. This just guarantees you get the right focus point, and your click doesn't go through the object. 
Now, if you want to change our focus multiple times in one shot, we can click the keyframe button to store the focus point. Then we can move down the timeline, change our focus and click the keyframe button again to store a different focus. So now let's move down the timeline, click on our camera actor and move it into a new position. Then click the keyframe button by the transform. And it is highly important that you move the camera actor, not the camera component. You can think of the camera actor as a blueprint and the camera an object inside the blueprint. If we move the camera component, we will be offsetting the camera's location inside the blueprint. That's why if we select the camera, you can see it has a transform of 000. So remember, move the camera actor, don't offset the camera component. So once we make another keyframe, we now have a camera movement path. So the camera will move from the first keyframe to the next over time. So this is the workflow you always want to follow when moving your camera. Move your timeline to the time you want your keyframe to occur. Move the camera and create a keyframe and set the focus. If you move your camera before moving your timeline, when you move your timeline again, the camera will snap back to the last keyframe's position and you'll have to redo the camera transform. So remember this workflow and it's the same for objects but without setting the focus. And that is everything you need to know on how to control sequencer. Now let's go over some effects and different ways you can capture a scene. So before we get into creating a scene, I first need to show you how you can have lots of different shots all in the same environment. So let's say we want two clips, one of our characters standing still and one of our characters sitting down. And we want to capture this in the same spot in our map. Well, what we can do is select our actor in the level, then select track in sequencer, click actor to sequence, and our actor, if selected, should be at the top. Now we've added our actor to the track, what we can do is right click the actor and convert to spawnable. We can also do this to convert the actor back to possessable. You will now see a lightning bolt next to our character and this just means our actor is now scene specific. So it will disappear in other scenes and reappear in this scene. Okay, moving on. How do we actually make actors and objects do things on our screen? Well, what you need to remember is that when you're capturing a scene, you have no control over your character or object. So all the actions must be set up before we hit that render button. And to make a scene, we use a combination of three things. Animations, blueprints, and sequencer settings. So let's start with animation. You'll need an animation for all of your scenes involving characters. And the most common way of using an animation is by bringing in a skeletal mesh adding the actor to the shot, clicking on the plus sign, then under animation, selecting the animation you want that mesh to play. Our character will now play our selected animation and we can adjust it by extending the clip to loop it or we can change the position of the animation along the timeline by clicking and dragging it. So here are some examples where I used animation. We've got our nodding scene, we've got our looking down scene and waving scene. So you'll use animation for almost every one of your scenes, so I really hate to say it guys, but you might need to practice your animating skills. Once we've got some animations in our scene, we're most likely going to want some interactions or functionality to be going on. A door opening, an explosion going off, this is all done in Blueprint. Just think of any Blueprint functionality you've learned over the time working with game dev, and you can use this knowledge to bring your scene alive. What we can do is either call blueprint nodes to run on a delay or we can call events directly from sequencer. To call a blueprint from sequencer, we can add that actor to the track. Then we can click the plus sign next to the actor. Under events, click trigger. From here, we can add a keyframe, then right click that keyframe. Under properties, select the event dropdown. Go to quick bind and type in the name of your event. This will now trigger your event at the time you set it in the timeline. So for functionality, use blueprints. Here's some scenes where I use blueprints. The train moving was actually a cube set to rotate back and forth. All the train components were then attached to this object. The conveyor belt was actually just a striped material, where inside the blueprint we turned panning on and off to make it look like the conveyor belt was moving. For picking up objects, I actually had three different objects in a blueprint with our character. The objects would then attach to the mannequin's hand out of line of sight. Then the mannequin would move, the item would detach, 
and when the item was moved off the screen by the conveyor belt, they were teleported back into the original position. So unless you want to animate all these objects doing these things, it's cheap tricks like these which allow blueprints to really have an impact on the functionality of a scene. Once we have our animation done, and we have our blueprinting functionality done, we can now tweak both these things in Sequencer. The main way I use Sequencer is to change the transform of an object. For example, if we want to move our character while he plays a running animation, we can make two keyframes with him at different positions and change the transform. We can also add tracks to our actors or blueprints in a scene. So let's take our third person character for example. Let's first add him to our scene. Now we can click on the plus sign and look through the component to decide what we want to change. So let's add the skeletal mesh. Then for the skeletal mesh we can click on the plus sign again to change certain properties of that mesh. And there are loads you can choose from but let's say we want to change the mesh colour. We find the material we want to change, so element 0. Then we can change the parameters of that material. So the only parameter in this material is body colour, so we can change that. Now we can change our body colour inside Sequencer. For anyone wondering how to fade in a character or make them disappear, this is the method you use, except you'd make a parameter for opacity inside the material, then change the opacity over time in Sequencer. So there are loads of different tweaks you can do to actors in Sequencer, so be sure to have a mess around with them. And that is everything you need to know to actually create a scene. Just remember, create animations for characters or objects if you want them moving in a very specific way. Use blueprints to create events and actions triggering in your scene. And use Sequencer to polish up both of these things with different tweaks and effects. Now let's go over a few more important techniques. Here we have the curve editor. If we click the graph button next to our FPS, we can adjust how each keyframe transitions from one to another. By default our keyframes are set to fade in and out, but we can click on a keyframe to adjust it manually by moving the line, or we can choose one of the above settings. So feel free to mess around with these settings, but for the majority of the clips you'll either use the default settings, or linear settings which goes from one keyframe to another with no fade in. Of course there are loads of other options so do have a play around with them and remember if you're adjusting keyframes yourself, less keyframes and less adjusting looks a lot more smoother and more natural, so keep that in mind. We can add slow motion by adding a new track, then adding time dilation and adjusting it over here. We can fade in our clips by adding in the fade track, then keyframing it to go from 0 to 1 over time at the start and 1 to 0 at the end. When it comes to movement, like I said earlier, you can give your character a moving animation, then you can keyframe the character to go from one location to another by adjusting the transform. This is a perfectly fine method, but if you've got your character's feet in the shot, you might bump into some issues with the feet sliding around. To fix this, you can use root motion, which basically uses the root bone to drive the movement of the character. For this, you first need a root motion animation, where the root moves with the character. You then need to open up the animation and check root motion inside the details. And from there, you can convert your animation to a montage and play the montage in your character blueprint. Voila! The movement is now driven by the animation. So here's something you need to watch out for. It can be really annoying if you don't know about it and it's pissed me off numerous times in the past. If you're trying to delete an object on the screen, but you have something selected inside Sequencer like a keyframe or an object, when you press delete, you will be deleting your keyframe or the object, not the actual item inside your level that you're trying to delete. If this happens, you can press Ctrl Z to undo, which will deselect anything in Sequencer, then you can delete your object, or you can click somewhere in Sequencer to deselect your item, then you can delete the object in the level. Okay, final thing, rendering. What we can do is click the action button next to the spanner to bring up the render menu. So we can start by deciding our output directory here. This is where your renders will be saved to on your PC. Now, time for the important stuff. Always render your clips in 4K resolution. Even if you plan to re-render the footage in 1080p, the quality of your footage will be insanely better if you render in 4K so make sure you do this. Next is compression, and compression is basically the software compressing the file size of your clips down to become more manageable. 
However, this also comes with the price of having a reduced quality. So this setting is completely dependent on how much space you have on your PC and what quality you're looking for. Now here's what I'd recommend. For anyone who wants good quality and very manageable clip sizes, go for 75 compression and a four second clip will set you back around 30 megabytes. For anyone who wants amazing quality and has a big ass hard drive, go for 100 compression. A four second clip will set you back around one gigabyte. This was the setting I used for my mannequin cinematic. And for anyone who wants the best possible quality, uncheck use compression, but be prepared for a huge file size. I can't remember exactly, but for my pirate cinematic, I rendered something like an eight second clip without compression being checked, and it hit me for around 35 gigabytes. Now, one more thing you need to know. Sequencer is made in a way where you can create all your clips and then render the entire sequence in the master sequence. If you want my advice, do not do it this way. Back when I was new to Sequencer, I tried using this method and regardless of the settings, I couldn't manage to render past a minute of my footage due to crashes. But I could render each clip separately, no problem. So if you want my advice, especially if you're rendering with little to no compression, render each clip separately, then put them into a video editing software and put the clips together there. And a quick disclaimer for anyone trying to watch their clips after they've rendered them with little amounts of compression, don't worry, your clips will probably lag. I'm running an RTX 280 Super and when I try to watch my clips, they lag an insane amount. However, once you've imported them into a video editing software and rendered them out, you won't face this issue. This does however bring up the issue that you can't edit your video properly because of the frame lag. So if you're gonna be doing a lot of precise video editing, like timing a video to music for example, what I'd recommend is rendering on a low compression first, then editing your clips, and then replacing the low quality clips with high quality clips at the end. So guys, that is it for me. If you have any questions, be sure to drop them in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and supporting my channel. I will see you all next time. Don't let your